it's it's hard demoing the thing that you call a wiki in front of Ward. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that go? <clears throat> uh, he he said something at the very end. He said something like looks cool or something like that. And you know, like my brain froze. It's like <gasps> Ward said my thing looks cool or something, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. It's also super funny. I, I don't think I told this story. I don't think you were a place where I told this. I know I told this story, but I think it was another place. So you haven't heard this yet, Jerry. Um, Ward has got that total sensei, sensei vibe. And oh, you did hear this story. You did say it. It's so weird watching people, watching watching Ward say something that nobody agrees with, but no one is going to like go against him. <laughs> And it wasn't for like anything informational, like like wiki stuff, you know, that's like, okay, whatever, you know, yeah. but it was like, uh, where I think it was where, where the, the, the first help. one, the first wiki birthday call, like the last couple of minutes, uh, I think it was Mark, uh, Mark or uh, John, Abby, one of them said, and we wanted to talk a little bit about plans for, you know, coming up to the 30th, the, you know, we should make plans. Ward shut down the call. He's like, yeah, you know, I I think we've had a great call. I I think I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's like, okay, I guess we're filing out. Anyway, so we did get to to talk about that in the second call. But then the the, the surprise then was, you know, well, where should we hold hold this recent changes camp? And somebody's like, everybody's quiet, waiting for Ward to say something. And finally, somebody says, one of the acolytes says, I think we should do it in Portland because that's the place of the first you know rcc and and it's you know ward's place and ward says how about the midwest it seems like that would be a better place for all of the people who might attend you know so i was like okay whatever ward yeah. has spoken as long as it's not chicago in december uh detroit in march eh, that could work end of march I'm adding a thought to my brain for the 2025 RCC for the 30th anniversary. <clears throat> I mean, you... this, this is next year, right? Yeah. Yes. This would be 29. Next year on March 25, I think, because that yes. was the date. Is that right? Yes. What's um, the event? Sorry, I came in late. Uh, Wiki birthday. Uh, oh, this okay. last Monday was uh, the 29th anniversary of the first wiki. Oh, that's and cool. We had we had two uh, wiki birthday calls with Ward. And then, you know some of the the old timers. Cool. Were they recorded? Are they posted any place? John recorded the first one. I don't think it's going to get distributed. Um, and the second one wasn't recorded. Oh, well, that's too bad. Oh. Pete, could I ask you for the recording of yesterday's AI Entrepreneurs Call? Yes. Can you forward me the yes. Zoom download link. <clears throat> Thanks. I forgot to, um, forgot to ping I'm going to trim the end of it off and post it uh, unlisted to YouTube. Oh, OK, perfect. Thank you. I was going to do something roughly the same. Thank you. Sorry to make more work for you. No, not at all. I, you know. Um, so I set up two new, uh, wiki communication channels, uh, there, oops, not that, um, uh, re their recent changes camp channels, one in matrix and one in, uh, CSC MetaMost. Nobody's joined yet except Bill Anderson, I guess, to the MetaMost one. Oh. But let me announce them here since, uh, did you announce it in town square? I didn't, and I, it's, I, 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 I did actually, um, I announced it in Massive Wiki, the Massive Wiki channel in CC Metamost. Unfortunately, I didn't hail. I, I had done two hails in a row, and I'm like, I'm not going to hail on this one. Probably that was the one that I should have, but whatever. So here's Massive Wiki. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Recent changes count matrix on matrix, and here's the Massive Wiki one. Good, I'm in. Now there's three of us. <clears throat> Yay. What's new and exciting? Uh, what's the name of the app that uh, 
automates things. Pete that, Pete, that you turned us on to? Uh, oh. Um, yes, yes. It's called Cassidy. And, and Cassidy. it's a bad sign that I my unaided recall of Cassidy is shitty. I, I have three times now. I've tried to remember its name, and I don't remember its name. I, I think that's actually not a bad sign. Um, uh, the, 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 a lot of the marketing is going to be viral. So it's actually OK if you don't quite remember the name. Yeah, but I can't tell anybody about it without looking it up. That's really bad. Well, but now you've looked it up. Now you like double remember well, it. And now, now, about, now it might be a bunch of people talking about. It, it. <laughs> well, so I, I was going to call it a Claudius. So, so unaided recall was close to the with a starting letter, which is typical for me. I usually remember starting letters of stuff, but I had no Cassidy was not in my head at all. Maybe now, and if it takes you four tries to remember a name, that's miserable for for product naming. Unless, unless they I, do something to make it stick. I, I, I think it's it's bad for individuals and it's not bad for social. So it's my prediction. Um, uh, I've, I've been waxing poetic about Cassidy. Uh, it's it's uh, somebody, Justin Feinberg, I don't know if you know him or not. Um, Jason, Jason just, I think it's Justin. Um, he and a, a team put together uh, office automation for uh, like a small business or something like that um, with LLMs. And I was pretty blown away by the demo. It, it seems really powerful. It's, it's sort of like yeah. if this, then that only done bigger, better with some machine intelligence. What and, does it accomplish? Like, what is it doing? Um, it it does the informational things that you would do if you were like uh, the president. If you were running a small business, if you ran a small business, you'd need people to um, watch the email, uh, do research for you, um, help you, uh, you know, uh, do customer support, all that kind of stuff. It, it's kind of instead of just well, I'm probably overblowing it, but instead of task automation, um, it's more like virtual employee spec. Yeah, it, it feels like virtual employees. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so if you if you think of the jump from ChatGPT to GPTs, um, this is like two more jumps like that. Kind of, um, it's you know, a collection of GPTs. And then they're autonomous or semi-autonomous, and you know co co they can cooperate and stuff like that, uh, and work with mail, uh, email, or um, uh, or the web, or um, you know, like your your common office tools kind of stuff. <clears throat> it also understands your corpus. It has all of your you know whatever corpus you want it to have. It has that. It's got some special automation on top of that, which is um, let me read through all your marketing materials. It, it does this. It does this as a background thing. Basically, it wants to understand the way that you present your uh, corporate voice. Um, so kind of in the background of stuff that you do, uh, it learns your corporate voice by reading your marketing materials and stuff like that. So and then generate you can correspondence talk to it about that, you know, Hey, let's talk, I, you know, I, I need you to adjust the, the way that you think about the corporate voice, all the instruction that you do for it, all the automation stuff you do with, uh, with, um, kind of like the wizard you use to set up a GPT. It's a natural language interface that says, you know, Hey, go out and do this kind of research. Or when you're talking to customers, do this, or I need, you know, um, in the customer support workflow, I need this to happen instead of that or whatever. What's interesting is it looks like in one of their demos that gives a little footnote, presumably to give you a reference for where the answer came from. <clears throat> it does that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice. That's the, the new thing with the RAG stuff. Um, anybody who's implementing RAG commercially does footnotes. And, and I was a little bit surprised. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I was a little bit surprised. We were watching the autonomous bot, I think do tech support, customer support, customer support, not tech support. Um, and it was writing an email to the customer. 
and it included the footnotes in the email to the customer. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I would do that. Even though it was to, you know, the footnotes were to their like support material on the web. I, you know, I don't know how many people are going to get that. I imagine those are some stylistic things you might be able to tweak. Sorry, I'm go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I would feel like most people would like to be able to like read further into things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, even for a support thing, like our, I, our support. I, I don't disagree, but I have a different judgment of hoi polloi, I think. <laughs> um, I think the, the three of us here learned about footnotes in the time before the web even. And it's like, oh, yeah, footnote. I think a lot of people nowadays are going to look at a little number after a thing, and it's like, that's weird. It's fine. You think that people who are using the web right now don't know how to read footnotes? I don't yeah. think that's true. I think we're all like the characters cool. in Wally. -E. We're just basically sipping our sodas, getting automated stuff shipped to us with drones, and shrinking inside of our bodies. Our, our bodies, our bodies are bloating as our skeletons <laughs> are shrinking. Exactly. Uh, Chris is acting it out right now. Uh, there you go. A, a related thing. I think. I think normal civilians on the web would be surprised and probably not most of them won't figure out what a number after after a, a phrase means on the flip side something that totally surprises me is i see normal people civilians shipping around bare urls um, because we don't have a better way to do it basically um uh and it's like like people don't freak out when there's a url you know even if it's one of the really long ones with a bunch of tracking stuff so the other thing is people don't know how to trim the tracking stuff that's off bad because... i tried to insert a, i tried a chrome extension that was supposed to trim those tracking things and it didn't work for shit so because <laughs> when i when i add any url to my brain i always clean that that stuff off the back yeah yeah I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I, I know people are doing that. I noticed recently that um, Firefox has a right click option to copy URLs without tracking. Wow. So people are thinking about it, right? And Tumblr famously runs every link through href.ly, which strips all the URL parameters off of it. Hmm. So I do think people are thinking about it. And I do think people could read footnotes. Like people still read books. Footnotes are in books. People still go to school. <laughs> Footnotes are even in in high school. I think that it's I think that it's there. You know. So, I, so my I guess like is people don't humanity. read books. <laughs> and and so my guess is people don't read books and schools don't teach footnotes. Is that that's my my base assumption about the world? I don't think that's true. I mean, maybe there are some particularly bad schools, but uh i mean i work with college i've worked with college students my partner works with college students i think in both cases generally we can rely that people understand how footnotes work i wish we could run that study i wish there was a study for hire that we could like pay 10 bucks and get that done yeah I, i'd be interested in such a study but i I really do suspect that, like, dependably, people are um, you know, <laughs> able to understand what a footnote is. Hmm. I, I will adjust my expectation a little. Not, not a lot, <laughs> but a little. Or, or more likely, you know, not a, an actual footnote, but just the URL, like click here to find more is a easier grammar, I think, than I, I think, I think every, I, so Aram, I probably would both agree that people can do that. Um, the thing is that gets really clunky in inline text, right? When you, we've got an LLM answer, you really want to do it like a footnote, probably a, a well, a, a hyperlink footnote. Right. That's why I said. Like, I do think the LLM um, no, the, the uh, I do think like the what is it? Is it Amazon or Microsoft that has footnotes in their 
chatbot responses. Yeah, I think it's Microsoft. Yeah. So like other chatbots are looking towards that model. I think it's a good yeah. model, right? Like it, having it having these systems acknowledge that like data has its sources is going to be important yeah yeah I, I think i think it'll happen more and i think people will get trained what uh, hypertext or hyper you know hyperlink footnote is i think that'll happen yeah um chris can i ask you a dumb question about subtle custom <clears throat> sure so um my impression is that the magic of Subtle Kasten is the encoding scheme that Lumen created that he wrote at the top of every card. And then when I look at computers, I'm like, gosh, we're so, so capable of more things. How are people implementing Subtle Kasten? Are they doing that weird little encoding thing or are they actually doing better than that? Like, and if, if not, what? So uh, I think most of the space comes down to, and what's interesting is they, the two things were essentially created plus or minus six months in the year 1230. Is It's the idea of a concordance with just raw search um, and a subjective index. So the vast majority of, you know, and there's a, a group of people who, when they say Zettelkasten, they mean a Nicholas Luminesque Zettelkasten. Mm -hmm. But in practice, almost none of them practice that way or use a, a decimal finder or indicator and, and or they don't, because it's in a digital context, they don't actually attach the new idea right behind or even link it directly to the, uh, another idea. So I, when I see people showing examples of theirs, quite often they've got a lot of orphan ideas that really should be linked to something or in a chain of things. And almost never is there a chain of things in any of these graphs, or if there is, it's only three long and it's never, it's very rarely do I see a digital version that has a, a chain of something like 10 or 15 deep. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, really what most people are practicing is a, a more traditional commonplace book practice. And they're putting tags on it and they're using the tags to find the stuff or they're just using raw concordance word search. Look for these three words and I get 10 results and then you got to filter through the 10 results to get the one you want, which doesn't... The sad part is that doesn't scale very well after you've been doing it for 20 years because you're going to get 500. You know, if you're a Lumon and you look for sociology, it's everywhere. This so is, this is the problem with backlinks in Rome and all the other backlinky tools too. Yeah. So having a decimal number attached to it is great if you're using it to. And the the one thing that always happened with Lumon system because of the way he did it you write down a new idea and it always gets a number and it always gets a specific place in relation to other things around it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I see doing it, they'll write a note and they just throw it into a folder and then it's just floating out there and it's really attached to nothing. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's attached by a few tags. Well, um, Lumen, Lumen's encoding scheme was, was sort of chronological and then contextual with multiple contexts available, right? So so um, chronological because his, this is box 15 and here's where we are in box 15. Um, no, he he didn't have time or date stamps on anything. Oh, I thought, he was, I, thought he was, I thought he was collecting linearly through the boxes. No, no. So if you asked him, he might remember it. Oh, yeah, I wrote that in this year or such and such. Okay. But if you actually go through his physical box, the digitized version, there's no dates or times on any of it. Huh. And it's literally the, and he's specifically not filing by like category or topic. He's taking, here's an idea. So let's say my, my first idea is peanut butter is really great. 
And then my second idea is chocolate is really good too. I'm going to, he's not filing them both under foods or taste or flavor or anything else, but he's like, Oh, chocolate. And I'm talking about taste. So I'm going to put the two together. And then when he goes back and he looks at the two cards and they're right next to each other, he's like, Oh, chocolate and peanut butter. Ah, let's, you know, Reese's pieces. Let's make a Reese's pieces, peanut butter cup and go from it. So that's kind of in tiny aggregate. That's what he's doing. And that's how he's kind of using it to generate ideas. Interesting. But his second idea, if he's talking about sociology, his next card that goes right behind it may be something to do with anthropology or maybe archaeology, something totally unrelated to sociology. But he knows the two in his mind are linked in some way. And over time, they may become further and further apart because he's putting new cards behind individual ones. But it's still at least that those ideas are in a neighborhood of space. But it only works for him because he's seen it. And so half of the system is in his head. Right. And he's able to search. But if you look at his index, his index is incredibly sparse. So you look at his index and you'll see the word sociology pop up in German. And there's only two entries. What? But the whole damn thing mm -hmm. is about sociology. But he, the two entries he's got in his index are kind of saying, here's roughly kind of where I would start on that topic. That's and almost all of his index entries are one or two entries to say, go look, look here and in this neighborhood. But it, and it's very rare that you see even three or four indexed entries unless things are very far apart and it's super duper super rare to see five or six or more so then whereas they're... most people who use like let's say obsidian mm -hmm. they're going to put the tag you know friends of the link on every or like you in your brain it's all friends of the link is going to have a lot of tags on it that holds things to that one page so the more calls we have the more things you're going to have under that search term um and in in Luman's version he's going to index it once maybe twice and then never after that so i didn't realize that the neighborhood really mattered to him that that, that he was working yeah. spatially that way i didn't realize that at all and that makes it seem less useful to a third person to a second person. oh yeah to a third party searching it who doesn't know what's going on or what's where but to him having read it and having had the experience and occasionally kind of flipping through and reviewing over it, he's going to know roughly where most things are because hmm. he's going to have a kind of a visual, you know, associative trail memory. If you want to use Vannevar Bush's terminology. Yeah. But the nice thing he can do is, Hey, I want to write an article on this topic look it up in the index, find the neighborhood, and then you can pull out a big chunk of cards from that neighborhood. And they're all going to be interrelated ideas. And you can then just spit out an article based on a chunk of material you pull out. Um, so if you think, if you want to think about it, and it probably the best way to look at it, um, Springer Verlag publishes math books at the undergraduate level but the graduate level ones are better to look at and each theorem and definition and proposition is going to have a decimal number and they're going to be in or in an order mm -hmm. logically for publishing the book um but if you think of making a book like that in reverse order you're putting all the numbers so you'll have a theorem with one number and you're obviously you would put the proof of that theorem as the next number right behind it because they're intimately linked. And then you're going to have those two things very close to the definition of the words that are in the theorem and or the proof. So within that neighborhood, if you're a mathematician writing a book, all those things are going to tend to stay close together in a neighborhood. And then when you decide to write the book, you can literally pull those things out, 
and just more or less dump them into the book mm -hmm. and you've got the book written mm -hmm. you may adjust one or two things so this and sounds... then you renumber it top to bottom yeah chapter one gets the number one chapter two gets the number two but theorem one in chapter one is one dot one one and exa example is one dot two dot so you can look at the table of contents and you may go three or four decimals deep as an outline but then that outline will exactly match and when you look at the individual page you could cut it up and break it into little zettles that you could file you would file close to, to, to themselves so, so he's I, literally writing it in reverse so they're like index so the index goes to like these neighborhoods and the neighborhoods like sort of have a landing index that the index is directing you towards that's linked to the other items that are related to it positionally yeah Would that be okay and then if you want to get really crazy and you have another idea that you're not going to index you don't want to spend the time to write another index card to index a new idea that may be far away from where it might go and you want to put it somewhere else you'll go to the card that you might also write and you'll write a link a written number link down on that first card but you'll still put it somewhere else so they're still interlinked and you can follow a trail so your index may say go for this topic go see this card and then after you flip through four or five cards after it you'll see another link that says oh look at this other bigger crazier number way over there to find a continuation of this idea that's also related to something else maybe it's politics or whatever that thing is in your system so you're it's all interlinked but what most people don't realize is his um his index is like ridiculously sparse mm -hmm. um thank you i i did not you, i did not know that about it at all go ahead Aram. yeah are you familiar with like um the, the one of the conventions that have emerged in the obsidian community is like the up and down key fields um which sort of sound related to this where you might define a file as having a file that's up above it as like sort of like ascending towards an index and then down towards deeper explorations of this idea that may like be related but not like necessarily something that you would link in the text of that particular file uh does that sound sort of similar to what you're talking about in terms of like the sparse index i mean obviously like you'd think like there'd be a bunch of top of hierarchy level things yeah, that could be composed into a sparse index it's kind of similar and if you want to think of it and i, I nobody i think but me has ever said or envision this but there is a if you think about the id the na neighborhood of ideas um you can if you're we can stick with luman's example of sociology you're a sociologist and you're going to spend 30 years on the topic the the rate at which the tag sociology or the index term sociology becomes totally useless to you is very fast or you know if you were anthropology there are subfields of anthropology and even those subfields would probably very quickly kind of fill up and become useless so you don't want to tag anything but the more specific the tag you put on something the more valuable it gets both for search and finding a particular idea and finding ideas in that neighborhood but as you take big top level categories and you become more and more specific the most specific tag you can put on something is the title to the card that's most directly associated with it or that follows it um and that's so you can kind of go from the very broad general down to the super specific and the most specific is a direct link to just one other card and so then when you're looking for the one thing you're always going to find the other but then when it comes to writing about whatever the thing is and actually using all your cards to create something all the things you're going to need are going to always be 
either in a specific neighborhood or within that neighborhood, you're going to have pointers that say, oh, grandma lives five miles away and she, she belongs in this family. So we're, you can go grab her and bring her over for the family reunion of writing whatever the piece is you're writing. Um, if that makes sense. And then when you're done, you just file there. They've all got numbers. So you file them all back away where you need them. Um, but it, there are kind of quirky things that you, I know a lot of people don't get far enough into the system to really realize what those affordances look like for them. And you, they get lost. Um, so the, the initial startup cost for setting up a Zettel cost and whether it's paper and index cards and tabs, or if it's in obsidian and you have to learn how obsidian works, the upfront cost is big, mm -hmm. but as you're using it over time and ostensibly not adding 5 million plugins that you have to keep adding the overhead for the cost of using it becomes way simpler. And I, what's interesting is this week I've actually been reading a, um, a book from 1908 about a researcher who was talking about creating card indexes for business use generally. And he makes the exact same point. And essentially he says a lot of people are using books or notebooks or ledgers in their business use. And they don't use the card index system long enough to realize any of the gains. Um, and then the other thing too, is as you're using it and you're more familiar with it, the speed with which you can use it. So I can write a card and I can almost immediately imagine where to put it. The, that filing piece becomes nearly automatic. Although I find in a lot of cases trying to do that in a digital system where I can't see it all. I have to do a search to find the thing and then make the link. And then, and then it's where I want it to be, but it takes more work for me to do that than it does on a piece of paper in, you know, a big box. Um, so the more familiar you are and the more specialized you are in the use of it, the faster it becomes and the more useful it becomes. And I, I've been trying to collect examples of like really good, um, like speed things. So I'm reading a book on, um, uh, poverty and there was a, a history book from 19, I think 34 that I was interested in. So literally I highlighted it and I typed in the year 1834 which I do occasionally for certain historical reference things. And I discovered I already have something tagged under 1834. I'm like, you know, that's weird and bizarre. But what it turned out to be was a reference to the poor laws in Britain in 1834. The Spinamon laws. Which Beatrice Webb researched and wrote about in 1910. Oh, wow. And essentially said, the way these laws are written, they're being implemented in different ways in different areas. So they really don't help because it's the mayor of this local city that really is more dependent on how he applies the law to make the law useful or not. And in her sociological research decades later, she essentially said, these laws are so poorly written and the effects are so dismal it's just useless and so britain got rid of all those laws because she did the field work to find it and say they're totally useless so it's and you know that's the kind of stuff that doesn't happen now even with the u.s government we make these laws and then they usually they prop up institutional power and sideline minorities in very careful ways, you know, and nobody's actually watching what happens five, 10 years later, the general effects, the, the people who are put into the minorities feel it and see it, but it's hard to fight against because, oh no, these are, these are laws that apply to everyone. Mm. You know, it's, 
we're doing a horrible job of that kind of stuff. So, Cast it but works. it was interesting that because I can find a tag for 1834, I was immediately able to put this one book on poverty together with something a century and a half ago, almost immediately. And then the first thing I do is I look in the index of the book I'm reading. Does this author who's talking about and researches poverty, does she even, and there was no reference to these laws in the 1830s in London. So it's like, oh, here's a, a brand new fresh area to like explore all this stuff in. Did you find that your I way never to... in a million years would have thought or found or discovered. Did you find your way literally to... because of a quirky link? Did you find your way to, to the Great Transformation, Polanyi's book? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's like so many books on my list that I'm reading right now for these kind of things that. Um, yeah. So everything, Chris, everything you said is fascinating from the perspective of the Neo Books project that we run on Mondays. <clears throat> um, one of the one of the juicy questions we've been bumping up against a lot is how to nuggetize ideas or information, um, and then how to recompose the nuggets into alternate narratives uh, to write a book, for example, or do something else, and two of the questions we haven't really answered yet, but Pete and I have talked about them a bunch. One of them is, how do you apply metadata to make that work really well? Uh, maybe three questions. One, how do you apply metadata? Two, how do you get related but not the same document or artifact together? And how do you bind them so that they're near each other? So even just the, tran the transcript of a video and the video itself are two objects that need to be kept close together. And then three, we want these... Um, artifacts to be alive, to be ever improving like a good wiki page, <clears throat> how do you create conversations around or what is the right set? What is the kind of crystal clear set of ways of interacting with these nuggets so that you could just like it, comment on it, or actually try to improve it or actually fork it and use it in your own work. And those are yeah. kind of those are kind of the levels of involvement. But all of that is sort of nugget dynamics that I'm really fascinated by. Well, I'm starting to think, too, that the big issue in a lot of these things is the difference between the concordance word search. I'm looking for the word encyclopedia and things around encyclopedia. And it becomes even harder when there are other words in other languages with different spellings or synonyms to encyclopedia, which is really concrete enough that that's not as big an issue. But let's say I'm looking for the idea of Zettelkasten, but then there are related words like commonplace book and florilegium throughout history that are related to and very similar to that. And how do you find those links? And concordance search is super hard to do that and really what you want is a more subjective like book index version but because it's subjective the index you and the words you use for it are going to be different than the words pete uses for it um and having all those done and most google search is usually the easy concordance search but you're not necessarily going to find you'll find a quick answer but you're never going to find the really great thick deep answer if that makes sense that you might find by looking in 10 well indexed books for the same idea you're looking for or um another kind of variation of it is um mortimer adler's syntopicon has 102 big key head words and then each of underneath, underneath each of those are more subtle shades of kind of longer phrases or sentences relating to those words where he's taken okay aristotle wrote about this plato wrote about it and then centuries later montaigne touches on it and hume touches on it and those ideas under let's say politics 
or can be all wrapped up, but you have to be able to delve down more deeply to find the things that are really related. And that becomes a much harder, bigger group problem. So you have things like, um, you know, Paul Outlet's Mundanium uses kind of a, a, a keyword thing, but in addition to keywords, he has dates and locations and time periods and, and he strings them together essentially the way you would algebraically with plus symbols, although he used different symbols. So you can have politics in the 17th century in France. And then if you want to add the idea of chemistry to that, what does that look like and where do you go from there? And doing that in a kind of standardized way that be, is easy for everyone to use becomes a lot harder. Um, so it's easy to say I'm, I'm Melville Dewey and everybody should use the Dewey system. And then once everybody does, it's, it's simple. But when you go to 510 in the math section and you find something related to politics, which would never be found in the 510 section, how do you, in that book on math, you know, let's say it's in topology, so it's 512, but it's an idea about politics in a math book. How do you, how do you then figure out a way to standardize things so that politics idea can also be found when you're in the politics section. And that's a much harder problem to and, solve. And a piece of the problem there is the nugget size is the book because the book needs to get shelved yeah. in the right place where, yeah. where the book contains a whole bunch of ideas and it might contain a case study about the use of topology and politics for doing analysis or something like that. And that nugget ought to be free to roam. Um, and you'll, if you pull out, let's see, so I can pull out Steven Pinker's words and rules and really here and tiny, tiny print next to my finger here are like three subjects. So the book itself will be indexed in the card catalog under a big topic, probably linguistics, but then the book itself usually has three or four, some maybe go up to 10 subtopics that are further away than the section you're going to find the book in. So <clears throat> those secondary or tertiary topics may also be indexed in your card catalog under those Dewey decimal numbers, but then they're going to point back to the book in the linguistic section. Um, but it's still, even harder than that, because you might find that politics thing that's not even listed in the front of the book. So you're never in a million years going to find it in the card catalog because it's, you know, so many layers deeper. You're going to have to really cast about and dig around to find this type of stuff uh, or that type of thing for that nugget. So that nugget may be about politics as it relates to linguistics but you won't find it because it hasn't been indexed and cataloged to that level of specificity. And if you search for it on Google, let's say, you know, you, you're going to have to filter through a lot of stuff. So per, Pete's comment, in the, per Pete's comment in the chat that doing this is really expensive. Um, how do we get this kind of performance from a less expensive system? And I'm thinking here that, if each of us takes nibbles of this and does it ourselves in a way that concords with other people, then we're somewhere on the road to doing that, right? Maybe? Yeah. So well, that's the thing though is, and you know, Pete makes the point that the Centopicon is one of the most expensive volumes in publishing history. But the issue there is after 1952, they stopped what if they had continued on and continued adding things to this in Topicon, either in paper or index card form or something else that then allows you to take, 
I think there were like 470 some odd works in the great books. Um, which didn't include the Bible, although they indexed the Bible in that system. So it includes those as well, those books as well. But what if you continue doing that and you can look at, so Steven Pinker doesn't exist in the Syntopicon, but if people had continued indexing those types of works, certainly at least the big public things, you know, it'd be great to have like, you know, Kuhn or Popper in the 20th century and their system, their coverage only went up to, I think uh, Sigmund Freud was the last. Isn't this something that Google's knowledge graph does, which is Danny Hillis's old project? I don't, I don't know that it does it incredibly well. And that's the issue is there's some subjective stuff that gets added in. Yeah. And then there's also, I mean, the nice part about the Syntopicon is the quality level of what you're going to find in there across Western history is phenomenal because they limited it to less than 500 works. So you're going to, when you look for a topic in there and you find it, you're going to find some, some of the best stuff ever written, hmm. but you're not going to find modern stuff. You're not going to find new stuff. You're not going to find really nuanced stuff. I mean, it's fine that you don't find the pablum that you find in the public square of Twitter. That's okay. I don't mind missing that kind of fluff. But, you know, the next two levels beyond what the Syntopicon was, that would be really nice. But they spent all this money and did all this stuff, and then they quit doing it. And thus the kind of the vow, and it's, the, it's that issue of, yeah, you try this new system, and if you quit before you start r revealing the massive gains to be had, you know, and in a paper era and pre-digital, they couldn't have. But I yeah, think had they, started, even... had they started the Syntopicon in the late 80s at the birth of the web, mm -hmm. boy, man, you would have, Could there would be the a town. company that does something Google is not doing and doing it incredibly well. And it I, doesn't I, look like it's even digitized. Yeah, I have a, a digital OCR PDF copy of the entire enterprise. But I and there may be a, there may be one company that digitized all of it, but it's a subscription service. I think you got to pay for. Um, and uh, honestly, for the payment versus. I'm, you can go out on the open market now and find a full set of those books for maybe 300 bucks for, you know, four to $5 a copy, I think is the going rate. Um, and it's easier to use the books than it is to use the digital service. Um, yeah. But I always think, Hey, how much better would it have been if these, and the, essentially it was graduate students were most of the 26 that they were in the 50, 40s and 50s paying probably $2 an hour for their indexing work. Um, if you had kept that up across at least, you know, popular literature since then. So partly this was you, a, a, you, an attribute you know, of cheap, you have something cheap graduate valuable. labor. Partly this was attributable to cheap graduate labor. It's, yeah. it's a little bit like Doug Leonard's psych project problem. <clears throat> Um, uh, Pete, you're it's, I, I don't know. To me, it's the dichotomy between the concordant search and the subjective search that you find in most book indexes. And there, we really don't have a search engine. Google can intuit a lot with just the concordance word search and pages that other things are linked to. But I tend to find when I'm looking for something that's three layers deeper, you you don't find it through i don't find the things i want through google search i have mm -hmm. to like dig into not only books but then the book index to find the paragraph or the sentence that i'm looking maybe for and that that takes a lot more work and there are some ai tools like research rabbit or what um 
elicit that kind of help there. And I find those are the AI tools. I think I find more valuable than the chat GPT, which usually just spits back such a generic pablum that, you know, it's unhelpful altogether, mm -hmm. except for the lowest level of, you know, uh, chat assistant stuff that I, you know, you'd send to a CRM system, maybe. Yeah, I, it's funny, you know, it, you, you're basically describing like the entire art slash science of like library science, right? That, that's what you've just described yeah. is the, the problem that library scientists attempt to solve. And even and then, lexic it's lexicographers yeah. and a bunch of other trades too, ontologists. Yeah. Yeah. Or even, um, because you can even look at things from, a, you know, a, not just even the large language model side, but, um, you know, there are some much more very specific branches of linguistics that look at broad language patterns and what falls out of them when you can look at all the words ever spoken in a language and what that could produce versus... You know, it's the difference between a close reading of a text and a what's called a distant reading of a text. Chris, why are you not an academic wearing a tweed jacket with elbow patches and smoking a pipe? Ah, it's the money. It's the money. It's, it's the filthy lucre. Or, or it's um, the the other issue too is I left college and went into businesses and other stuff, and then. It's now academia is so hard to get into now, even to go back to it. Huh. Um, I had a friend who died 2015, 2016. He, he had reached the highest rank of professor one could at the University of Southern California. And he, I think when he died, he was making almost he was he was making a salary of over 200,000 from the university in addition to other consulting fees that went way higher beyond that. Um, when he died, the they took the named professorship, dropped the salary, and then went out and hired 10, 10 other faculty with that same money. Wow. Um, and so to be, even to be a faculty member, you know, you're, you're, it's, there's just no, almost no money in it. And then yeah. the, only a portion of your time is actual research. So right. it's, it's almost easier, you know, you could be doing the same thing and you're probably doing roughly what I am is you have a day job that makes enough to get by so that your, your hobbies doing things like this are easy enough to do the other things you want to do. Um, Something like that. But, we blame the what is it the you call it the cuckoo of capitalism yes the cuckoo bird of capitalism i love that um yeah thank you i i that i was that was a curiosity and boy that i pulled on that thread and it turned into a, a sweater on the floor it's good and it's interesting how many different i mean it's are, fun to delve into but it's all yeah it's interesting how many different and groups and tech people uh, are know, trying to make sense of the world, including LLMs, right? Because what we're doing right now is we're feeding the corpus of everything into these neural nets and, and helping shake them until they represent what's connected to what. Yeah. I, but generally, we're doing it too without... There are a lot of research groups that are looking at the history of all these problems and most of them are incredibly well delineated kind of what has worked and what hasn't in the past and then it's okay now you have this massive computing power and search power how do you leverage that against those pre-existing problems and I, I when i look at most of the space most of the technologists even some of the academics who are in the space are totally ignoring everything that came before and it's like let's start from ground zero and i, I for the life of me i can't figure out why they would want to do that mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm, you know, maybe computing power is just so big and so cheap that they'll get to the same place almost as fast as they would have otherwise, but I have to s suspect that that's not the case. Although Jensen Huang is on the case on that one. Yeah. Although I have come to the realization recently, too, that um, I always fault Vannevar Bush for holding us back because he never mentioned things like the commonplace book in his original essay. But apparently, as a broad category, Vannevar Bush, if he could get away without citing any prior work in any area, he would. <laughs> And it was literally a career long thing for him that he did that. And it made it much easier that given his position as a Dean and a senior scientist in the United States during the war, he could get away with it in ways that if you were an academic today, you probably, unless you just yeah. were doing military rated engineering research and you weren't publishing except internal to the government with clearance, you wouldn't do that anyway. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, and then there's a, a guys like Paul Outlet who worked for decades with government money out in the open in the public, but it really wasn't until the later you know, 70s, 1980s, that people really discovered and saw his work. And then it's like, oh, that looks like the internet now, instead of we're making the internet now and let's look at what happened before and see if we can't mimic and use the solved problems that they solved 40 years ago to recreate that thing now. Mm -hmm. So the internet recreated almost whole cloth what he had done in the you know teens 20s and 30s um, but just with a lot more people <clears throat> these people would have enjoyed being alive today <coughs> today i think uh or in the in the late 80s certainly that you know would have worked out pretty well mm -hmm. cool Um, we've kind of gone through our hour. Shall we fold this pup tent for the day? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let that ferment for a while and come back with more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's, 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 you know. Or if you figure out the, the, how the solution between the bridging, the gap between concordant search and creating a 